Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled On Death, Dying, and the Future Hope. This is lesson number 13 in this series for December 24 of 2022. And next week, we're going to be on December 31, so we're actually going to have 14 lessons in this quarter. So this is not the last lesson. This lesson is entitled, The Judging Process. This should prove to be quite interesting. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Our loving Father, we recognize your presence with us and guidance as we study these lessons together. There's a lot of things that are misunderstood, and this is one of the ones that's misunderstood quite a lot. Help us to study it together, to speak the truth about it, to share and discuss together in ways that will make it useful to those who listen in as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In this lesson, we will discuss God's judgment. God's judgment. The idea of judgment is very clear both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And one of the one things I want you to think about for just a moment, because it's going to come up later, is does God's judgment mean the judgment of God, or does it mean God's judgment of us? You think about that. Or does it mean both? Or both. Well, we're not going to rule that out. In 1 John 3, verse 20, we read, Jim. If our conscience condemns us, we know that God is greater than our conscience and that he knows everything. American Bible Society. Okay, and the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes 12, 14. God is going to judge everything we do, whether good or bad, even things done in secret. The Good News Bible. Okay, so if we believe that God is omniscient, what does omniscient mean? All-knowing. He knows everything. Then he does not need any kind of judgment process for his own benefit. This is really important to understand then uh, the end time final judgment will take place when God reviews the records of each individual <clears throat> and demonstrates to the onlooking universe whether we are savable or not savable. Now that's a very controversial issue, but I think we're going to make it very clear, hopefully, in our time together today. This process will take place before the entire heavenly host. Not only the angels who live in heaven, but also all those who live in other parts of the universe. Think about Job 1 and 2. Uh, if you haven't read that recently, it's a good thing to do. God's goal is to be perfectly transparent and to make it clear that those who are invited to join the heavenly society are safe to admit there. That's the issue. And of course, um, a part of that is, is God telling the truth about us. We know from Revelation 12, 7 to 9, that war broke out in heaven. Satan and his followers were cast out of heaven because they were not safe to be allowed to remain in heaven. Gordon? The war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated, and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and all his angels with him. So what kind of war was that? Yeah, that's a good question. We've talked about that a few times. It's, for surely it was a, surely it was a war, war over ideas. Were there weapons used of some kind? Uh, we don't know. Are words weapons? Yes, words can be terrible weapons. There weren't physical weapons used, presumably. We don't think, we're, we're not aware. If there were physical weapons used, we're not aware of what they were. I have some idea that in Judaism, that uh, if a person destroys, attempts or does destroy another person's character, mm -hmm. that is like a killing. Yeah. So that's, but outside, if you, they don't, if, <laughs> It was a character assassination is what was going on. So Lucifer was character assassinating God. Trying to. Trying to. Yes. So now 
the important point for us to get here is not only that Satan was at one time in heaven as Lucifer and cast out with his cronies, but also because he was cast, he was cast out because he was not safe to remain there, not safe to have him there. Did he, perhaps he just left and, and a third of them left. But it, does, it does say he was cast out. Yeah, so, but... The, the, whatever that means. And the point is, if, if God is going to think about admitting some other people like us into that environment, he better make sure that it's safe to have us there or he'll have to go through this process again, right? So how does the judgment actually take place? Let's look at some verses in the Bible that very specifically talk about the judgment. Myra? Yes, in Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, and his, the, the hair on his head was white as wool. His throne was fl flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. The river of fire was flowing, coming out from, from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. That sounds like New quite a court scene, doesn't it? Yeah. From our New International Version. It's important to recognize who is doing what in that judgment because there have been a lot of misinformation about that. God the Father is in charge. Um, we'll discuss a little bit about what that might mean. Satan is accusing us and Jesus is defending us. Where do we see that picture clearly presented? Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. This is from the Old Testament, a book that I hope you're all familiar with. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, if you remember the situation in the Old Testament, the high priest was supposed to do what? Represent all the people as he approached the the sanctuary, the, especially at the time of the Day of Atonement, he would actually approach into the most holy place. So this is what Joshua is now standing on behalf of all of humans. And there beside Joshua stood, <clears throat> guess who? Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. That's what Satan does. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick, snatched from the fire. Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes, and we know from other parts of the Bible that filthy clothes represent what? Sin. Yeah. Sins. The angel said to his heavenly attendants, Take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. He commanded the attendants to put a clean turban on Joshua's head. They did so, and then they put the new clothes on him while, while the angel of the Lord stood there. Okay, so what does this mean? It is important to recognize another very significant point. The central issue in the great controversy has always been the question, who is telling us the truth. Remember Satan's very first act, statement about God in the Genesis 3 is, God is lying to you. So the question is, is it God who is telling the truth or is it the one we call the liar, Satan? So the universe is watching to see how the judgment will come out. Is God telling the truth about us and about how he runs his universe? Or is Satan telling the truth about us and about God? Do we have any questions about who's telling us the truth? Certainly not in this group, right? The judgment takes place in several different sections and periods of time. When the judgment is all over, the whole universe, including Satan and his angels, will be down on their knees admitting, we have this right in the words of Scripture, admitting that God has done what is right. And I quote Philippians 2, 10 and 11. Jim? Jim? And so, in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees. Verse 11, and all will open, excuse me, and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord 
to the glory of God the Father. Good News Bible. Okay, when it says all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below, how many does that include? It doesn't leave anybody out, apparently. It doesn't, including Satan and all his friends. Who is in the world below? Well, that's a term that the Jews use to describe, and the Christians use to describe the world of the dead, so forth, but it's also, I mean, it's in a number of places. Jude, for example, it describes that this is the dwelling place of Satan and his, and if you go to Revelation 20, it's very clear that he is locked up in this place. The great controversy will not be over until everyone, and that includes Satan and all his fellow angels, have agreed that God has done everything that he could do to save as many as possible. I like to say that there are five judgments. This is a little different than our Bible study guide suggests, but let me, let me just try to spell this out. One, there's a pre-advent judgment going on right now. That one started in 1844, based on what we know from Daniel 7 and 8 and 9. And it has to happen before the second advent. Why? Number two, the first executive judgment, executive means some, God actually does something other than just make a decision, meaning that God takes action at the second coming when the righteous will be taken to heaven, both the formerly dead righteous and the living righteous, and the wicked living will perish. So that's clearly God doing something, right? Sure seems like it to me. Then three, the millennial judgment, during which the righteous who have been taken to heaven will review God's judgments and agree with them totally. God doesn't make any mistakes, but he says, okay, have a look, see if you find any problems. The millennial judgment will allow the righteous to be involved. Four, the judgment by the wicked, including Satan, at the third coming, when they will also agree with God's judgments. Philippians 2, 10, 11, which we re just read, and Great Controversy 670 and 543, which we'll look at a little bit later. So we're suggesting that even the wicked, all of them, will have a chance to look at God's behavior and say, yes, he was right, or no, he wasn't right. And finally, five, the final executive judgment, when all who are out of harmony with God will be separated from the source of life, God himself, and perish forever based on their own choices. These points are very important key to understanding the outcomes of the judgment. Okay. That would be my, uh, Gordon. From the writings of Ellen White in Great Controversy, Satan sees that his voluntary rebellion has unfitted him for heaven. He has trained his powers to war against God. The purity, peace, and harmony of heaven would be to him supreme torture. Okay. Can you hey, imagine that? Yes, I, I, want you to, I want you to tell me what does that, how does that work out? I mean, this is a guy who is determined to fight against God, to imagine put him in a place where perfect, everything is perfectly peace, per perfect harmony, purity. His character is so fixed that he yeah. can't change. It's, and it would be just, he would be, every second he would be wanting to say something bad against the people who are there and against God, but he wouldn't be able to. It would be torture for him. Go ahead. Another from Ellen White, also from Great Controversy. A life of rebellion against God has unfitted them for heaven. Its purity, holiness, and peace would be torture to them. The glory of God will, would be a consuming fire. They would long to flee from that holy place. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. We're talking about the wicked here, okay? Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. Great Controversy 542. Selfishness, greed, and covetousness would be completely out of place in heaven. That's what we're suggesting. God is not arbitrarily saving some and condemning others. God's judgment is perfectly transparent, so the judgment process is only revealing the truth about each one of us before the entire onlooking universe. 
Matthew 5, 31 to 46, and that's the story about uh, the people who came into the wedding and so forth like this, and John 5, 21 through 29, we don't have time to read them right now, make it very clear in the words of Jesus himself that judgment um, will ultimately separate the good from the evil, the faithful from the disloyal, and each group will be raised to life at a different time. The righteous will be raised to life at the second coming, and the wicked will be raised to life at the third coming. And let me just be clear, I didn't make it clear. Matthew 5, 31 to 46 talks about the, how God treats the sheep versus the, the goats, the, the good versus the evil. Okay? Uh, okay. Myra? John 5, 21 to 29. Jesus said, Just as a father raises the dead, and gives him life, in the same way the Son gives life to those he wants to. Nor does the Father judge himself judge anyone. He has given his Son the full right to judge, so that all, who, all will honor the Son in the same way that they honor their Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I'm telling you the truth. Those who hear my words and believe in him who sent, sent me have eternal life. They will not be judged, but have already passed from death to life. I am telling you the truth. The time is coming. The time has already come. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear it will come to life. Just as the Father is himself the source of life, in the same way he has made his son to be the source of life. He has given his son the right to judge because he is the son of man. Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all dead will hear his voice and come out of their graves, and those who have done good will rise at the second coming and live, and those who have done evil will rise at the third coming and be condemned. It's good news Bible. Okay. Jesus himself described how the judgment takes place. <clears throat> John 3, 17 through 21, and this is right after that probably most famous Bible verse in the entire Bible, John 3, 16. It goes on to say, Jesus himself speaking, for God did not send his son into the world to be its judge. I thought we just said that God gave his yeah. judgment to the son. They are, they're working at this together but to be its savior, that's what Jesus came for. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. There, there is clear explanation from Jesus' own words. That, uh, if you back it up a little bit farther down, that word is, is in the Good News translation that says judge, uh, some of them say condemn. Yeah, that's which, which has to do with with uh, separation. Yeah. Okay. Or judgment has to do with separation. But Jesus came to bring in, in, ha into harmony all of His creation. So judgment is going to. We're going to see that judgment means good things for the righteous, while it means condemnation for the sinners. So um, this is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light, because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that, that what they did was in obedience to God. Again, from our Good News Bible. These verses make it very clear that God's judgment only reveals the truth about us and our choices while living on this earth. Do we prefer the light, or do we prefer the darkness? Jim? From the Bible study guide, while reflecting on the judgment, we should keep in mind that we are saved by grace, from Isaiah and Ephesians and so forth. Uh, the basis of the judgment process is God's moral law as, as summarized in the Ten Commandments, from Ecclesiastes, James, and also James. Our works are the external evidences of the genuineness of our saving experience and consequently the element to be appraised during judgment. 
Now, I, there again, I'd like to substitute the word healed. Yeah. It's rather the saving experience. That, that thing is, the word is too, lo too loaded and doesn't, is not properly describing what goes on. Remember, there is no arbitrary decree from God electing some to be saved and others to be lost. Each one is morally responsible for his or her, her own destiny. Um, Gordon, you want to take that next one there? In the end, the judgment is not the time when God decides to accept or reject us, but the time when God finalizes or recognizes our choice as to whether or not we have accepted him, a choice made manifest by our works from the Bible Study Guide for Sunday. Okay, the first portion of the judgment process started in 1844 and is taking place right now in heaven. As we have already suggested, Daniel 7, 9 through 14 tell us that millions of the heavenly host will be our jury. Matthew 22, 1 to 14, and Revelation 14, 6 and 7 make it quite clear that this first phase of the judgment takes place while we are still alive on this earth. This is not something that happens sometime later. Okay, from the Bible study guide, it says the concept of the pre-advent investigative judgment of God's people is grounded in three biblical teachings. One is the notion that all the dead, righteous and unrighteous, remain unconscious in their graves until the final resurrections, John 5, 25 to 20. We've already talked about this. The righteous will be resurrected in the first resurrection, the second coming of Christ, and the wicked will be raised at the third re coming of Christ. With the wheat and the tares of a, s yeah. a similar uh, yeah. way of expressing that. Mm -hmm. The second is the existence of the universal judgment of all human beings. It's Second Corinthians and Revelation. The third is the fact that the first resurrection will be the blessed reward for the righteous, and the second resurrection will be the eternal death for the wicked. John, uh, here again, the same, same places. Yeah. What does this mean for all human beings? What this means is that if all human beings will be judged, they should be judged prior to their respective resurrections. Because of those resurrections, they will receive their final rewards. Okay, so the people who are resurrected and taken to heaven at the second coming, God is not going to come along and say, oh, sorry, you weren't supposed to be here. I'm, you got to go back down. You know, God doesn't make any mistakes. Okay. Uh, the book of Daniel helps us understand both the time and the nature of the pre-advent judgment. At the end of the 2300 symbolic days in 1844, the heavenly sanctuary will be cleansed. And the pre-advent investigative judgment will begin. These are all in Daniel, yes. and some in Hebrew. Uh, again, the pre-advent investigative judgment will begin two different ways of expressing the same event. And the judgment is in favor of the saints of the Most High, Daniel 7.22. That is good news for God's people. Okay. From Monday, from Monday's Bible study guide. December 19th. So we've seen uh, several things here. One of the most important things is that Satan basically doesn't want to go to heaven. He do, it would be torture for him. The, the, the wicked do not want to go to heaven. It would be torture for them. So there shouldn't be any problem in, in deciding that it's what's fair here. Hebrews 9, 24, Daniel 8, 4. Yes. And yet... Some will say, Lord, didn't I cast out demons in your name? Didn't I heal in your name? Mm -hmm. And they will be lost. Mm -hmm. how, does that, how does that mesh with, with what well, you said, just said, that uh, yeah. we will go where we want to? The, there, there are lots of people. I mean, look at all the people on television right now who, who are claiming to perform miracles and so forth. But there's lots of other things that God teaches that they don't like at all. But when they get there, they may think they want to go there. Yeah. Just like when I came out for starting my career in nursing, I thought I wanted to go in a certain area. 
and obviously God had a different direction and I kind of went I don't know why I didn't realize that but that was yep you know the direction I needed yep. to go and that's where you found me yeah that's where I found you so these verses, Dan, Hebrews 9, 24, Daniel 8, 14, and Daniel 7, 9 through 14, make it clear that the pre-advent judgment is taking place in heaven. It will result in good news for God's faithful people, Daniel 7, 22. The pre-advent judgment is for the purpose of clarifying in the minds of the entire onlooking universe that the, people of God, that the people God is planning to admit to heaven is, are safe to live next door to for the rest of eternity, and the wicked are not. And Satan and his angels were cast out because they were not. So this is not something new. So if God is judging us right now and the entire universe is watching to see how we are doing, shouldn't that impact the way we behave every day? Jim? I'm, I'm sorry, it's mine. The Bible tells us that the second coming, one, both the living saints and the resurrected saints will meet the Lord in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Two, all the saints will be taken to heaven to abide in the heavenly dwelling places that he himself has prepared for them, John 14, 1 through 3. And three, only at the end of the millennium will the new Jerusalem come down to this earth and become the everlasting home of the saints, Revelation 21, 1 to 3, and 9 to 11. So during the millennium, while the earth remains desolate, the saints will reign with Christ in heaven, Jeremiah 4, 23, and Revelation 20, verse 4 from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Now, what I hope you're observing as we're going along here is that while we don't have nearly time to read all these verses, there are many verses from the Old Testament and New Testament. If you put them all together, there's strong support for these ideas. And if you want to get our handout, it's available at our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3 and Revelation 20, 4 to 6 and 11 to 13 make it very clear that during this millennial judgment, the resurrected and translated saints will participate. So what needs to be accomplished in that judgment process? Jim? From the Bible study guide, whole judgment, excuse me, the whole judgment process is intended, number one, to vindicate God's character against the accusations of Satan that God is unfair in the way he treats his creatures. I mean, he's obviously unfair. He threw, he threw Satan out of heaven, right? That's what some would say. <laughs> That's what Satan, he would say. Especially Satan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, number two, to confirm the impartiality of the rewards of the righteous. Number three, to demonstrate the justice of the punishments of the wicked. And number four, to dissipate all doubts that could lead toward another rebellion in the universe. In the pre-advent investigative judgment of the righteous, only the heavenly hosts are involved, Daniel 7, 9, and 10. But during the millennial judgment of the wicked and the fallen angels, the saints themselves also will participate, 1 Corinthians 6, 3, and Jude 6, and Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6. The proce this process provides an opportunity for the saints to evaluate the heavenly records and see God's fair judgment in all cases. He not only rewards all humans, human beings according to what they deserve based on their own decisions, but also explains to them why he does so. Okay. So from the Bible study guide for December 20. We're going to see that when the final stage of God's judgment is over, every individual, every individual who has ever existed and those who will occupy heaven, I'm sorry, yeah, and those who will occupy heaven in the future new earth will have had an opportunity to see God's fairness. Even the devil will bow down and admit that God is right. And of course, that's from our Philippians chapter 2 we already read. And then he will proceed to attack the holy city. Yes. Yes. The Satan will. Satan will. To show how he really hasn't changed. No. As we suggested earlier, God is also on trial before the entire universe. He has been repeatedly accused by Lucifer slash Satan of not being fair to angels or to humans. In the final judgment, God must prove his fairness to all, even the devil. And that's our 
quote to Philippians 2, 10, and 11. But there's more on that subject. Romans 3, verses 1 through 4. Have the Jews then any advantage over the Gentiles? Or is there any value in being circumcised? Much indeed, in every way. In the first place, God trusted his message to the Jews. But what if some of them were not faithful? Does this mean that God will not be faithful? Certainly not. God must be true. And even though every human being is a liar, as the scripture says, so let me do that again, verse 4. Certainly not. God must be true, even though every human being is a liar. As the scripture says, you, that is God, must be shown to be right when you speak. You, that is God, must win your case when you are being tried. Good News Bible. Now, you remember the question I raised <laughs> back at the beginning. Is God's judgment a judgment of us? Well, yes, it is. That We've seen that that's true. But is it also a judgment about God? Does each one of us, either by choosing Satan's side or choosing God's side, we are making a judgment about God, right? If you determine you don't want to listen to him, you've already made a yep. judgment that you don't want to hear, hear what he has to say. You don't trust him or whatever. Do all versions, so this is Good News Bible, and we inserted, I inserted the word God in there, mm -hmm. when you must be shown. Do some versions use, imply that it's humans that are being judged rather than yes. God? The uh, New International, the, the last paragraph, it says, may you... Uh, Prove to be right when you're uh, when you're when you judge, and several others have it that way. But that when you God doesn't judge. It, the other text it says God doesn't judge. I yeah. don't judge anybody, but their paradigm, their point of view is faulty. Not many people recognize that God is also on trial in the sense that the entire universe must ultimately be convinced that God has done everything right and that God can be trusted. Are we fully convinced that God has done everything right? Bible Study Guide says, During the Middle Ages, there was a strong tendency to portray God as a severe, punitive judge. Today, the tendency is to describe him as a loving, permissive father who never punishes his children. You can remember, let me interrupt for a second, you remember the famous sermon that we probably all studied at some point in our history is by um, the New Testament guy who said you hang by a slender, yeah. a, a slender thread any yeah. moment over the fires Jonathan of hell. Huh? Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards, yes. In, in early New England. Sinners, yeah. the, sinners, in, the hands of an sinners in the hands of an angry God, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yet love without justice will turn into chaos and lawlessness, and justice without love will become oppression and subje sub subjugation. That word. God's judging process is a perfect blend of justice and mercy, mercy both of which derive from his unconditional love. This final ex executive judgment, which takes place at the third coming of Jesus to this earth, might seem to some like a punitive action. God has taken some pretty serious actions against sinners in the past. Think about driving Satan and his rebellious angels out of heaven. Again, we discussed just that briefly. We don't know exactly how they were driven out or where they chose to leave, but they were, they were out. Two, driving Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3. 3, the worldwide flood, raining fire on Sodom and Gomorrah, 4. And 5, the destruction of the firstborn in Egypt. And 6, the destruction of Ananias and Sapphira, even into the New Testament. Some pretty serious action against wicked people. But the final executive end time judgment of God will be very different. There is nothing punitive about God's final judgment. Each person gets exactly what she or he has chosen for herself or himself. The righteous will get to have to live eternally with God, and the wicked who have rejected God's form of government will get what they have chosen. And from Ellen White, could those whose lives have been spent in rebellion against God be suddenly transported to heaven and witness the high, the holy state of perfection? 
that ever exists there, every soul filled with love, every countenance beaming with joy and rapturing music and melod melodious strains rising in honor of God and the Lamb, and ceaseless streams of light flowing upon the redeemed from the face of him who sitteth upon the throne, could those whose hearts are filled with hatred of God, of truth and holiness, mingle with the heavenly throng and join their songs of praise? Could they endure the glory of God and the Lamb? No, no, years of probation have granted, were granted them that they might form characters for heaven, but they have never trained their mind, the mind to love purity, they have never learned the language of heaven, and now it is too late. A life of rebellion against God has unfitted them for heaven. His purity, holiness, and peace would be torture to them. The glory of God would be a consuming fire. They, the lost, would long to flee from that holy place. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. That's Great Controversy 542-543. Second Peter 2, 4-6 and Second Peter 3, 10-13 suggest that God's final judgment will result in the wicked being destroyed completely. This is stated quite clearly in Malachi 4, verse 1. Jim? The Lord Almighty says, The day is coming when all proud and evil people will burn like straw. On that day they will burn up and there will be nothing left of them. That's pretty descriptive, isn't it? And then you want to read the next one there? Now, God's goodness and long forbearance, His patience and mercy exercised to His subjects will not hinder Him from punishing the sinner who refuses to be obedient to his requirements. It is not for a man, a criminal against God's holy law, pardoned only through great sacrifice he made in giving his son to die for the guilty because his law was changeless to dictate to God. So how often do we allow the criminals to decide what their punishment should be? You know, this is the, the date of that is 1876. Um, it's, she learned a fair amount after that time. Yeah. How could anyone, understanding the life and death of Jesus, suggest Are you suggesting, Jim, that, that she changed? Truth is progressive. I'm not suggesting. It's obvious. Re read, read her writings after that time. You're stating explicitly that I'm, she changed I, I, her I'm making her no views. wiggle room yeah. there from my point yeah, of view. She, yeah. she expands her views. Yeah. Um, how could anyone understand the life, understanding the life and death of Jesus suggest that God has not done everything he possibly could to save sinners? The most loving thing God could do to those who reject him and do not want to have a part of his government is to allow them to perish permanently. The, the cross makes it very clear what will become of those who reject God's offer of salvation. Christ's life and his death give us a clear choice. We can choose to live a life as far as possible like Christ's life, or we will die the death that he died. How could God have, and of course, separated from God? How could God have made things any clearer? Let us repeat what we have suggested earlier about the final end of Satan and his followers. From Great Controversy, Gordon? Ellen White. <clears throat> Satan sees that his voluntary rebellion has unfitted him for heaven. He has trained his powers to war against God. The purity, peace, and harmony of heaven would be to him supreme torture. Again, we're yes. reading this uh, again. Yes. His accusations against the mercy and justi justice of God are now silenced. The reproach which he has endeavored to cast upon Jehovah rests wholly upon himself. And now Satan bows down and confesses the justice of his sentence. With all the facts of the great controversy in view, the whole universe, both loyal and rebellious, with one accord declare, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. And uh, we note that Satan himself bows down and confesses the judgment of his sentence. And yes. As Jim read in Philippians 2, yeah. 10 and 11. The final end 
of all sinners will be in the lake of fire, which is the second death. Uh, Revelation 25 and 11 to 15, Myra. Yeah. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were over. This was the first rising of the dead. So uh, if we had a chance to read the whole chapter, we would say it's been talking about the second coming and the first resurrection. And then in verse 5, it, this parenthetical section, the rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were over. And then it goes back talking about what it's been talking about. This is the first raising of the dead. So it's, it's a little confusing there. Then I saw a great white throne and the one who sits on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence and were seen no more. And I saw the dead, great and small alike, standing there before the throne. Books were opened, and then another book was opened, the book of the living. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in these books, in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead. Death and Death and the world of the dead also gave up the dead they held. What does death and the world of the dead mean? That means anybody who ever died, no matter how they died, will, will, will arise and be a part of this judgment. Okay. Um, all were judged according to what they had done. Then death and the world of the dead were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. Whosoever, whosoever did not have their names written in the book of the living were thrown into the lake of fire. Good news, Bible. Okay. Revelation 21.8. Cowards, traitors, perverts, murderers, the immoral, those who practice magic, those who worship idols, and all liars. That would include Satan, right? The place for them is a lake burning with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. By our Bible study guide, thus the final annihilation of sin and sinners, in contrast to the unbiblical theory of their everlasting sufferings in hell, provides a just and proportional punishment for whatever evil people had committed. It also confirms that sin had a beginning and will have an end. Then the whole universe will, be, will return to its original perfection. Before sin, evil and disobedience arose mysteriously and without any justification. From our Bible study guide again. So the Bible study guide uses the term proportional punishment. Yes. For the wicked. So they're suggesting that if you're a little wicked, you get a little burning. If you're a lot wicked, you get more burning. You can't just die. You got to torture him for the appropriate so, amount of time. And, and what a ridiculous. And I disagree with that. Yes, <laughs> I do too. I, I don't agree with the proportion, you know, yeah. Well, <clears throat> since we, they don't give us any information here about the proportional part, so we'll, yeah, some of us would have problems with that. Now that we understand the choices that the wicked and Satan himself have made, it is clear that the idea that God could somehow save everyone in the end is completely false. I mean, does God want to save a bunch of people who absolutely don't want to be there. They don't like that environment. They're, they hate God and so forth. They don't want to be there. I think Richard Neese said something to the effect that God doesn't need to make any worse than it already is. Sin is sins pays its wage. Yeah. And you, you don't have to add on to it and get your pound of flesh or whatever term mm -hmm. that you... So some might question why God has allowed this whole great controversy sequence to take place, considering the fact that he could have prevented it. In the, this is from Ellen White again. In the day of final judgment, every lost soul will understand the nature of his own rejection of truth. How could, that, that paragraph uh, number 32, how could God have prevented the great controversy? Well, some people would say he should not, he should not have created Lucifer. I understand that. But he created anybody. Anybody has has a capacity to, to make a choice. Right. That's love, because there is love. Without freedom to make a choice, there is no love, and God is love. Yeah. So I think that yeah, that take some tweaking there. They, well, it's, it you would have to stop and explain uh, what you've said, and even more to make it clear. But there's well, a lot of that's people. That's what we have time to do. Let's let's make it clear. 
<laughs> yeah, well, or attempt to make it clear because yeah, a lot of people I agree. approach it with their presuppositions, their paradigm, and it, well, they haven't thought about it. No, basically, so they just it's just some, oh well. If Satan caused all this problem, God just shouldn't have created him in the beginning. Of course, that's, that's traditional thinking. Finished. That's their, that's their very superficial thinking. If Lucifer hadn't done it, someone would at some point in time. Right. Well, now you're, talking, now you're talking about freedom and you're talking about yeah. God's way of running, operating as government and that's a long story. Yeah. So in the day of final judgment, every lost soul will understand the nature of his own rejection of truth. The cross will be presented and its real bearing will be seen by every mind that has been blinded by transgression. Before the vision of Calvary with this mysterious victim, sinners will stand condemned. Every lying excuse will be swept away. Human apostasy will appear in its highest character. Men will see what their choice has been. Every question of truth and error and the long-standing controversy will then have been made plain in the judgment of the universe. God will stand clear of blame for the existence or continuance of evil. It will be demonstrated that the divine decrees are not accessory to sin. There was no defect in God's government, no cause for disinfection, disaffection. When the thoughts of all hearts shall be revealed, both the loyal and the rebellious will unite in declaring, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thy judgments are made manifest. Revelation 15, 3 and 4, and that's from Desire of Ages, page 58, paragraph 1. So is the following clear in your mind, Jim? Ellen White says, If you cling to self, refusing to yield your will to God, you are choosing death. To sin, wherever found, God is a consuming fire. If you choose sin and refuse to separate from it, the presence of God, which consumes sin, must consume you. Ellen White, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 62. Do you understand why God has a pre-advent judgment and a millennial judgment? Is that clear from some of the things we've discussed already? Anybody have a question about that? Clearly, this, at the second coming, God is planning to take the righteous, the formerly dead righteous, and the living righteous to heaven. So he has to make a judgment about them before that time. And the wicked, what happens to the wicked so at that time? Not, he has to make the judgment because he's already made the judgment. It's he has to convince yeah. the onlooking universe that those who Correct. go at yeah, the second coming are safe to live next door to. Yeah. There's another way. That word judgment is, is, has a lot of baggage to it. Yeah. Instead of using the word judgment, if we put a separation, now you've got the wheat and uh, the, excuse me, the, I guess, the wheat, wheat and the tares. tares. Uh, you get your separation, you wheat, you separate them. And that's really what, more what's going on rather than this uh, court system and, well, yeah, and, and seeing and all that stuff is, is misleading. Well, the point is, was we've, we've shown very clearly People judge themselves. Oh, of course. Some, well, you know, some judge God. God is the one that's on trial. There's, the, yeah, they're the wicked are, are are rebellious against God, and the righteous are in, in favor of God. Yeah. Well, do you see why God? Yes, we're gonna. Yeah. So, the pre-advent judgment is the rest of the universe judging <clears throat> those who are going at the second coming. Then the millennial judgment is those who are saved saying, why isn't my cousin Joe here? Yes. And realizing, figuring out that, oh, okay, that's why. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Joe didn't want to be here. Hmm. Maybe a person would ask that about, about their cousin Joe, maybe didn't know a whole lot about their cousin Joe. Because if, they, they, if they're a very observant, they could probably figure out some of the things yeah. and say, okay, well, that's, that figures. Maybe Joe wasn't out in the open. Well, do, you, do you see why God even allows Satan and all his followers, including sinners here on this earth, to see the truth and make their own judgments about themselves? Are you happy that God operates such a transparent government? Gordon, I think that's yours. From the Bible Study Guide, through his judgments, God restores his glory and vindicates his character. He does so openly and consistently so that everyone can know who he is. God wants all intelligent beings in the universe to understand his purposes and to know what he deals with 
and know that he deals with evil fairly, punishes the wicked appropriately, and saves sinners justly, with several references. Bible yes. study guide. God's judgment brings eternal happiness and peace to the righteous and brings final annihilation to the wicked. It brings a lasting solution to the problems of death, suffering, pain, injustice, and violence, which are all the results of sin, and there's references for that, a lot of them. When God is all done, he will transform our world into a beautiful reproduction of the Garden of Eden. Wouldn't you like to be there? There will be eternal peace and safety. If anyone should ever choose to rebel against God at any time in the future, we've talked about this before, God will be able to point back, and I've said it like this myself many times, suppose that a million years in the future somewhere, uh, God creates a new world with new beings, and one of them decides, well, I don't want to do things God's way, I want to do it my way. And God would, I'm sure, he would ask a bunch of us to stand around and he would say, here's a person who wants to do the great controversy thing all over again. What do you think I should do? And I think we will, huh? Step back. We will just say, it's your life-giving power that keeps him alive. Just step back. He and wants he will, to separate. Let him separate. Yep, that exactly. That person wants to separate from you, God. Yep. Let him separate. All its consequences and as, as proof that he should not allow such a thing. I think before he did that, he would say, sit down here. I've got a panorama for you to watch. Yeah. <laughs> starting from Adam and Eve on this earth, well, starting even from the re rebellion in heaven of Satan, and then Adam and Eve all the way through in the life of Christ all the way to the end. And if it, after seeing all of that, he still says, I want to rebel, God will say, we would say to God, just leave him alone. So, Myra? Yes, in the Bible study guide, it says, in the end, God will fully restore harmony and peace throughout the entire universe, Ephesians 1.10. Evil and anything or anyone who associates with it will be eliminated and destroyed, Matthew 25 and Revelation 20, 13 to 15. Um, everyone who totally and voluntarily submitted to God, acknowledging him as his or her creator, redeemer, Lord, and king, will receive everlasting life, joyfully serving and worshiping him forever, with a number of verses there. Lots of references for that. Thus, the original abundant life of joy, happiness, and peace will be restored and never again to be disrupted by any form of disobedience or rebellion. Again, with a number of... A lot of verses. Yeah. Again, encourage you to download this uh, material that we're talking about from our, from our website. <clears throat> and once again, we are reminded that God's justice and His righteousness will be fully revealed. Revelation 3, 21 to 26. Romans. I'm sorry, Romans, thank you. Do you agree with the following from the Bible study guide? Quote, the Bible testifies that when God calls the heavenly court into session prior to his second coming, and there's a whole bunch of references, the primary purpose will be to legally and eternally secure our place within the heavenly family. Is it really the primary purpose? Well, for the judgment, maybe at this point in time. Um, or is it to show that God is righteous? which is what it says in Romans 3, 24 to 26. John 14, 2 and 3 reassures us that Jesus is not building our places in heaven as a master builder, shaping a nice house or a mansion for us. He could do that in a matter of seconds. But he is, sorry, but he is legally securing our place in heaven before the representatives of the whole universe. There are certainly some who would say it's, he's legally securing it, but... I don't well, think that's what he's doing. I don't. I agree with you. Yeah. That's 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 from the Bible study guide. I, yes. I I would have to discount that one. It's well, dark speech. Yeah, maybe it's not a legal issue. Legality has nothing to do with all yeah. the, all of this stuff. This they say again. This legal proceeding takes a lot of takes a lot of time. It's attested in Daniel. Blah blah blah. A bunch of verses in Daniel. Jesus says the true witness will fairly. 
present our individual cases and proclaim in front of the whole universe that we as believers in him are his. We have accepted his death to purify us from sin. His grace is sufficient for us and the power of his grace works in us. Jesus secures our salvation legally, some would say openly, publicly, and transparently before all inhabitants of the universe so that no one during eternity will ever raise the question of something being done secretly or partially. Jesus makes it plain that the saved are trustworthy people and will fit into the heavenly family because God's amazing grace is a transforming grace that changes them. God wants us to be accepted into heaven without any doubts or question marks. Therefore, given the nature of this investigative judgment or pre-advent judgment, another name, it also can be called the affirmative judgment. What does that mean? What's affirmative? Confirming. Confirming, okay. That certifies, seals, and ratifies what was done during a person's lifetime. Affirmative judgment is a confirmation of lifetime decisions from our Bible study guide. God's final judgment simply confirms what each of us has chosen for ourselves. The panorama that will be shown at the, at the third coming to all, including to the wicked and all of Satan's angels, reveals the truth based on all that has happened from the rebellion of heaven until the second coming of Jesus Christ in the crowds, clouds. And um, we're running out of time here. Above the throne, we're told that Jesus will appear and everybody who's ever lived will see it and they will see this panorama. Despite all that, Satan will lead sinners into the final desperate attack against the holy city. If God gave the wicked another chance, they would simply repeat what they've already chosen. For a full and lengthy discussion of what the Bible and well and White says about the final end of sin and sinners, see the, hand, see the website that you can see there. So, uh, after cutting off, uh, Jim, you want to Take the first little bit, I've only got about 30 seconds left. After cutting off what was sick and sinful without possible healing, God acts a, as a recreator of life. He will create the new heavens and a new earth. Sin will never occur again. All intelligent beings in the universe will serve God faithfully out of love and gratitude because they know the goodness, love, justice, and truth of, of God. Okay, thank you very much. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have come together to discuss this very important subject, how the judgment takes place. And we have seen that God simply opens the books in heaven and before our entire universe of future neighbors and friends makes every case transparent. They see who, is, who would be very unhappy in the environment of heaven and they see who would be very happy in the environment of heaven. We, in effect, judge ourselves by our approach and understanding and attitude toward God. May that be very clear to all of us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.